I'm Paola Espitia from Olapai Creative. Welcome to Conversations by Water, a weekly Facebook live stream where we sit waterside with wave makers to share unfiltered, intimate, and inspiring conversations, exploring what it takes to drive change locally and globally. Our mission is to create a ripple effect and empower you to affect change in your lives and communities too. 70% of, of the surface of planet Earth is covered in water. Also, um, our brain, our heart, and our lungs consist of 70% of water. That's the epitome of what the ocean is to me. It's just like my heart and soul and it's love and it's connection. It was something that, that was going to stick with him for quite a while. I mean, read lots of books. Books will motivate you. Experience things. Experiences will motivate you. Watch interviews like this. But I have to say, being able to go out and make an impact. How many people do you interact with every day? You can be a change maker for all of those people. Now it's time for us to say, okay, everybody's had their chance. Now it's time to say, we're ready. We're going to kick it off and we're going to start making our beach the most environmentally friendly. The faster you're going to fall in love with water, the longer and happier you're going to leave. <laughs> we, we love so water. We love you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to a new episode of Conversations by Water. This is our weekly Facebook live stream where we get to talk to local wave makers who are making a difference in our community and globally. And today I am super excited <laughs> to have dear friend and fellow Nova Southeastern University Oceanographic Center alumnus, mm -hmm. Morgan Knoll. Yay! Go me, go you! Right? Like, that's kind of what it felt like we needed to do at that moment. I, I know, it's so cool. So, well, I'm super excited that you all are here. Morgan, like I mentioned, we went to graduate school together at NSU at the Oceanographic Center, which is there at the entrance of Port Everglades in South Florida. And uh, it was a really neat place, I thought, to go to grad school. For sure. And um, luckily for us, Morgan is still here in our neck of the woods. Woo! Which means she's doing awesome things with her degree and with her amazing personality and the skills that she has to help improve and to better our world and our planet. And uh, Morgan, I'm so excited to have you here. Well, I'm so excited to be here because I'm, I feel like everything that you said to me, I feel about you the exact oh, same way. Which is very fun. Yeah, we're just kind of like living off the same rainbow like laser beams. Thing. I know, right? <laughs> That's why it's so much fun to do these things because we just get to talk to all these really fun people. Yeah. So. Um, you know, a neat thing that we like to highlight on Conversations by Water is actually our backdrop. So today we are literally having a conversation by water. Mm -hmm. We're here at the Coolahatchee Park um, in Fort Lauderdale. We're just off of Davy Boulevard and 15th Street. Um, 95 is just on the west of us. Yep. And this beautiful, uh, the new river here is just behind us to the east of us. And so I hope you enjoy our view. And you can also come and enjoy it too. Remember, like the neat thing about Fort Lauderdale is that we are known as the Venice of the Americas. So there's tons of opportunities to have conversations by water. Mm -hmm. So we invite you to come out sometime and connect with people and so let's keep moving let's connect with Morgan so Morgan Paula there's a funny thing that happens to people who end up going to graduate school for marine biology <laughs> yes there's a lot of peculiar things that happen. and uh, one of those things is that we all have some kind of story where we first connected to water there was something mm -hmm. that triggered that love and that desire for us to keep going um, and keep learning and caring for the ocean. So, what was your first memory with water? Hmm, which is tough, because there's so many of them. I guess if I could go back to like two, three, four-year-old Morgan, um, I think it would have to be hanging off my grandpa's dock with a piece of turkey tied to a string, mm. dipping it in and off the dock of my grandparents' lagoon, trying to catch crabs or going fishing for flounder and sticking my head in a bucket and like stirring around and learning about all the critters that were in there. Cause that was just, that was my everyday afternoon. That was my weekend. That was like my life until, you know, later on in life when I kind of grew up and was like, oh man, I'm, I'm too cool. I can't, I can't just like hang off a dock, like pick up crabs and stuff. <laughs> so I, I guess it's like just that whole time period was just being in the water, being on the beach on Long Beach Island, New Jersey, because that's where I'm mm -hmm. from. So I was like, that was my playground. That was my therapy. That was my like lunch hangout spot, my work like that. And everything revolved around it. So it really wasn't like 
I had, I didn't feel like I had a choice. Like it was already kind of bred into me that I was like a water baby. So I didn't, it didn't feel like it was, it was just, that was how life was. And there that we both kind of loved the same things naturally by genetics that we like the same thing. So we kind of, as we progressed in life, we sort of had our own little ways, but we always wanted to be around each other near the water. And that was, that was it. There wasn't any other choice or variation or deviation of such. So we've always been following each other through on life. So we've gone to undergrad together and got our mass or our undergrad degree in marine biology, then got a graduate school degree here together. And Granted, now she actually works for an invasive plant lab, which is really neat, but she's still near the water and the Everglades is a huge important thing that goes on with our entire state of Florida, especially where most of our biodiversity comes from and tourism and stuff like that. So she works with that to help with the ocean. And then my mom also, she grew up in Long Beach Island, New Jersey too. So she, she was a water baby too. And same with my dad, like he's a sailor, he's a surfer, he makes surfboards, he's all over the place. He picks up trash, he works for Reclaim the Bay Project in New Jersey, he's all over the place. So it's like, we're kind of like a niche of water humanoid merm people. That mer people. Yeah, we're, just, we're that, more folk. I like that. Mm -hmm. We need more mer people in the world, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. Yes, we do. So um, after you went to undergrad, you came down here to Fort Lauderdale to go to graduate school. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about what your research was all about. It's kind of a very big, broad topic of kind of how marine debris affects the marine environment. Um, when I first got to NOVA, my initial plan was to get into coral restoration um, and coral reef ecology. So I really wanted to be able to use my aquaculture skills and the things I'd learned previously diving um, with the Marine Science Consortium in Wallops Island, Virginia, because that was like a part of my undergrad. Uh, to restore the reefs and I wanted to grow baby corals in the lab or in the field and plant them out in the reef. Long story short, I've tried a whole bunch of cool different product, uh, products, projects and danced around fish ecology and aquaculture and elasmobaric research and then kind of landed in this niche where I found that marine debris was such a huge problem um, and no matter whatever science research that I was kind of intending on, on doing, it was there. Marine yeah. debris was everywhere. Like when we go diving, when you would go diving for the cram lab, like we were out there seeing it every single day. And yeah. it got to a point where I kind of looked at what I was doing and said, you know what, if I want to make my message heard with like coral restoration, I'm going to do something that is a direct reflection of what we're doing that we can immediately stop doing to help restore our reefs and the marine ecosystems. So I kind of took my passion for the marine debris plastic pollution thing and ran with it. So I took data from uh, re the Reefish Visual Census Project, which is attached to the National Coral Reef Research um, Restoration Program. Um, we count fish, essentially, scuba dive and go count a whole bunch of fish, identify and measure them. Wait a second. <laughs> Say that again more slowly. This is what Morgan was doing and still does for work and for study. Okay. Go. So I'm a part of a project funded by NOAA Fisheries. And essentially, we make a census of all the coral reef fishes that are along the entire Florida reef track. My section, or our section, is kind of from Port St. Lucie to the Miami area, and we collect data and just count and measure everything that we see, and we see progress, abundance, and change over time. Um, so that's kind of where part of the data that I crunched for my thesis came from, because I was seeing it every single day, and you did that too, so we were like, man, this is a problem. The other half of my data was collected doing beach surveys, so I used NOAA's Marine Debris Program um, shoreline assessment project. There's a couple different variations of it, but um, went to the beach and counted every single thing I found and wanted to see if there was a change over the spatial distribution of the debris that we had here in Broward and the things that affect our beaches debris deposition whether it's Port Everglades it's people going to the beach or it's just currents coming from up and around the Florida right. Gulf Stream so it was kind of an accumulation of what our little pocket of South Florida is dealing with with the marine debris problem and how we can fix it and that's kind of where where things snowballed with my research because now I've just dove right into the deep end of the marine debris issue and there is so much more to learn mm. but there's a lot that we can do um, to change the current trajectories that are going on our path 
Yeah, and I'll definitely want to get to that in a second. Mm -hmm. um, you, you brought up a really neat thing, and, and that is that you know marine biology. A lot of people think that like maybe you're just studying whales and dolphins all day long. <laughs> Everybody's like, and we're playing with dolphins. Yeah, maybe that was like the the entrance like critter. Mine was whales. Mine was humpback whales. Like that, when I met humpback whales, I was like, oh, these are cool. I want to do more of that. Yeah. But then it switched. I was like digging for sand crabs and blood worms. Like yeah, it was right? gross. It's <laughs> something. <just> weird things. <laughs> but a neat thing that, that you actually took away was that, um, you know, and we talk a lot about is that, as you were saying, my work was in coral restoration. So that means that all my work was underwater. It was very close to shore, but it was underwater, out of sight, out of mind. Mm -hmm. And people couldn't connect with that as much because of that. You being out there and seeing, wow, not only do we have these coral reefs, but now they're actually entangled with plastic or tons of fishing line, or there's always some kind of, you know, a can, <laughs> bottles yeah. there like thrown out on the reef. So I, I very much appreciate that you actually kind of looked at that problem from a bigger scale and wanted to see how we could better connect to the problem. The problem being coral reefs, for instance, are not doing so well. One of the factors causing that problem is us. And so I like how you actually looked at the other side, the human side of marine science. That's mm -hmm. that's an angle that I think is only more so starting to be looked at now, is, is right. figuring out that we have to come at this from all different directions. Yes. And you're a very good people person. Yeah. <laughs> if you've ever met so, me, like, I'll talk to anybody. So <laughs> really. Sure. That's okay. We love that, though. And so um, now what you've done is you're doing a lot more of this outreach work mm -hmm. and a lot more education. And one of the ways that you do that is through YEA. Yes. So, so talk about that. Yeah, it's actually really kind what of... it stands for. Yeah, it's funny how, how that connection happened because it was right during... Um, time right after I finished like my thesis and I presented and I was like on the high of being like yeah I'm a marine scientist blah. Yeah, like, I super, made it yeah I'm done so <laughs> I know what <laughs> yeah so it was like what do I do now um so uh I went to um a, like a core reef task force like it was resilience reef resilience um conference at Ann Cole Nature Center mm -hmm. like right down the street in Hollywood and I went and was there pretty much with most of the Nova kids that were there because it was a really big deal. It was a really close one, uh, close conference. So it was awesome. Um, and I'm sitting there, you know, with my homies. And then this lady in the middle of like a workshop that we're doing raises her hand and starts asking all these really dope questions. And I'm like, oh my God, that lady's awesome. I need to go meet her. I found a friend that was on my table goes, oh my gosh, I know who that is. It happens to be the executive director of Youth Environmental Alliance, which is a 5013C nonprofit that's um, locally based and does environmental education and coastal restoration. So immediately I was like, I gotta go hang out with a lady. And long story short, she offered me a job at that conference. So um, Essentially, what I do with Youth Environmental Alliance is I am an environmental educator. So I use my knowledge and my background to try to foster environmental stewardship with the youth in the community and really anybody who listens. So it ages from like five to 200 if you're like a sea turtle. So um, it's really just taking, and I think it was a nice fit because I took my knowledge and the research that I've learned in grad school and then my crazy people person-ness and put them together and sandwich them into a power pack of awesomeness where I can take the knowledge I have and then bestow it upon my students or really anybody who's listening <laughs> and then hopefully that will transition into some type of change in them whether it's like a newfound excitement or passion for a particular marine organism say like a manta rays we have a conversation about my necklace at Publix and I'm oh my yeah. gosh now you're watching Moana now you're addicted to mantas right. so <laughs> just taking that tiny little bit and everything that I learned and smushed it to to spread that awareness making that that people science connection because we don't have a lot of bridges that connect over to the science realm and to the general population and everybody likes to hold on to their stuff they like to hold on to their data or you know the way that they write it doesn't quite project to most people and most people are the ones that need to know about it right so I kind of figured well I've got a goofy demeanor and it's slightly entertaining slightly. but educational at the same time so that I use that to my advantage to kind of like 
broadcast all of the knowledge in all directions. Oh, that's so fantastic. So yeah. it's super true. I mean, that, that that was obviously a big thing that I found too, is that there was very, um, there weren't that many people who could bridge that gap in communication between science and society. Yeah. There's the people who need to be getting that message. You do an amazing job of it. Thank oh, you so much for doing that. It's so fun watching you be out there and about. Um, and so one of the ways that you do that is through these dune restoration projects. Mm -hmm. And so talk about that. First of all, um, why do we need to restore dunes in the first place? Okay. What, what are they good for? It's a bunch of sand and some grass. Yeah, just some pile yeah. of greenery, shrubbery on the beach. Shrubs, weeds. Uh, <laughs> yeah, green stuff, all the chlorophyll. So uh, <laughs> we, uh, dune restoration is kind of like this overarching theme, kind of like what we kind of mentioned, like coral restoration. There's like a bigger, broader definition of what a coastal and dune restorations are really about. And it's, to break it down and simply, you're just trying to restore the dune habitat. Now people usually don't kind of um, look at the beach as a habitat. I mean, it's kind of like a habitat that we go to hang out and like tan and gallivant and play volleyball and you know, pick up seashells and stuff. But it is a living, breathing, super vital ecosystem. And if you were ever like me, I'm sure you were the same way when you're little or you every time you go to the beach and you just want to play with stuff, if you actually stop and look around, dig around in the sand, look, listen, and feel for everything that's around you, there's a lot going on. And when we kind of came into this like, whoa, blue mind phase where everybody's like, I need to live near the coast and coastal development became like a really big deal. You know, people were like, I need to get as close to the water as I possibly can. And by doing that, you put your development really up on top of that ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And if not destroy it, trying to get as close as you can, just so then you can get the pleasure of waking up in the morning and like looking at the beach or walking distance to the beach. Now, the positive thing about, I guess, from our perspective as humanoids, when we go through and we rip a lot of that shrubbery out, we get a lot more beach for us to hang out in, right? So people are like, yeah, I got like two miles of beach. I can sit up my whole camp and I won't be blocking anybody. But the problem is when you remove that shrubbery, the green stuff, that's really the only thing that's holding the integrity of that beach together. So the way most plants work and it's not limited to the beach, but because we're talking about the beach is related. The way trees are and shrubbery are, they grow in the ground, right? They have tons of root systems that web in between each other. They grow down, they grow on all crazy different shapes and sizes and stuff. And that root system holds all of the soil and other material underneath of it. And it ends up like fortifying the soil, reducing erosion and all that kind of stuff. Now, when you take those plants out, you're taking the only thing that's providing habitat for the organisms that need it, but the only thing that's keeping the sand in place, if we have a hurricane, if we have heavy winds, if we have a king tide, those shrubs are what's holding it together. So when we, put, when we moved in there, we ripped them all out, and all of a sudden, we're starting to realize every hurricane season, every summertime, when we have a lot of wave energy, the beach is getting cut away and cut away and cut away. And then people are like, where's my beach? I tried to put it up as close to the water as I could. Now it's disappearing. So now we've realized that the only true way to put the, that sand back and have it stay there for longer than a season is to reverse the damage that we had done, which is just put the green stuff back. Yeah. Right. So we took it out to fix the problem, reverse it, put the plants back in. And Youth Environmental Alliance kind of like tapped into that really early and hoping that most people would catch on to it. And the cool thing about what Youth Environmental Alliance does with the um, dune restoration and coastal restoration is we're, we're trying to let everybody know that there's things that you can do immediately and things that you can adapt and do in your own life that connect yourself to the beach to help restore. And that may not just be planting. It's not everybody's into planting stuff, but if you come to a restoration, whether that's with us or any type of restoration, you're restoring your backyard or whatever, you're providing habitat for other organisms and you're giving yourself that good happy feeling of that oxytocin and serotonin release that happens when you manipulate dirt and stuff. That's scientifically proven. So if you ever want facts, like a super dose of dopamine and get really happy and just calm and relax, go plant something. Um, so connecting everybody, getting you to the beach and getting your hands sandy and doing something that helps fortify the sand so it's good for us again it's because it's holding the thing that creates tourism here in south florida so we're retaining our industry and economy by helping to restore the beaches and um, we're protecting our 
coastal infrastructure because those dunes and those sand they reduce wind blasting from the sand so if you ever seen a power washer with sand people use that to clean stuff hurricanes and heavy wind do the same thing to your house and you can protect your house by putting those plants there to hold the sand in place it reduces saltwater intrusion so we got a crazy high tide waves aren't going to come straight through the streets and wash all the sand like it did during irma those plants are going to hold all that sand together to keep it together and then it's good for everybody else that's around it so all the organisms that use it we're a major flyway for migratory birds mm -hmm. who use it for food use it to rest we've got tons of of uh, sea turtles that use it as a reference point because we're one of the places that has a lot of sea turtle nestings three of the seven sea turtle actually i think four sometimes right. four of them four of all the sea turtle species that we have that are endangered they actually nest on our beaches and they use the dunes as an a marker for where they nest so if we don't have all these these things that provide habitat for organisms that attract people here the entire state's going to start collapsing and it just starts with the beach connecting you with the beach and the neatest thing about this program is that actually, like she was saying, anybody, any groups, families, this is also family friendly, can actually sign on and volunteer to help out restore these dunes that are right here in our blue backyard. So it's a really neat way to literally be involved, mm -hmm. get outside like she said, get, get your hands dirty, get wet, and be in the elements and actually be up close and personal to um, you know, being part of a bigger project, which is to restore these beaches and, you know, make sure that we have this everlasting sustainable mm -hmm. sand front for, you know, be beach community for the future. Um, I love that project, you know, and you, you get to do a lot of different things. So that, that's one of the projects you're doing. Mm -hmm. You get to uh, count fish every now and again. Yeah. <laughs> you also are writing. You're still doing some writing? I am for... still doing writing. So um, I kind of freelance and copyright for a couple of different groups um, because I, as much as I love expressing myself, I've always had a hard time putting my thoughts onto paper or on a computer. I get super excited, and if you know me at all, like I'm all over the place, so I write the way I speak, which can get a little tangenty. So, growing up, I, writing and, and, and math and all this, the stuff that needed like serious concentration work was really tough for me. Like growing up with ADHD and all this crazy, like I couldn't, there was no way I could focus on anything. And I challenged myself most recently, like when we really started talking back up again, I'm like, I'm like how can I like work on myself and spread my tentacles out in all directions is working on my writing skills. So I kind of jumped on the tackle my fear thing and start writing about the things that I'm passionate about. That way I can work on another vector of trying to connect with people, but also try to, to challenge myself and let myself know that I can do this. And um, I freelance and copyright for a couple different people. And one of those people is um, Barnacle Babes. And Barnacle Babes is an awesome magazine and ocean women conservation group that promotes just ocean mindedness and just women in general. So it's like, ha ah, kind of yeah. thing. And um, I've written a couple articles for them and done some, some really cool stuff live streaming with them and they're awesome. I've also helped out Planet Love Life. So if you guys are familiar, Planet Love Life, they are an marine debris awareness organization that cleans up um, ghost nets and marine rope and transform it right. into something that this is actually from ghost nets this is old fishing line yeah so most of about 46 percent of the debris that's in our oceans is from um, ghost nets fishing debris leftover um, derelict gear from fishing um, and what they do is they it's just like a simple reminder it's kind of like a little mantra if you will um, to be ocean-minded no matter where you are. So I connected with them and was like, I want to help you. So I practiced writing my, doing my creative writing skills for them. Um, and then also on my own social media too. Just like trying to make my Instagram like a, like a mini blog almost. Because mm -hmm. I don't really have like a blog blog yet. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Things are going to happen in the future hopefully soon. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I just try to push my creativeness in all directions. So that's... That's that little bit, I guess. Well, I mean, well, the, the neat thing about that, I mean, it sounds like there's a lot of things going on, but yeah. the, the neat thing about it is that you do have these really great skills that, you know, a little bit of this, and with, it's all about communication. There's yeah, so yeah, many yeah. different ways that you can be communicating with science, and you are diving into each one of those different ways. And it's great because everybody has different ways of learning, too. And so this right. way, you're actually um, hitting up a lot of people. Right. So you're reaching a lot of people in that way. 
And you know, what, what kind of advice would you have for um, people who actually want to go into marine science now and want, want to become a marine biologist? Right. So that's like the the big question, right? Yeah. Like you, every time you go like shopping at Publix or you're at like Lucky's or you're anywhere where there's people around you that you have like reusable bags and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And I'm wearing a t-shirt or you're wearing a t-shirt and people are like, they're like, what do you do? Like what, you know, you're wearing this shirt that says wave maker. What does that mean? Or, you know, you've got a sea shepherd shirt on. What's going on? I'm like, oh, well I support this because I'm a marine biologist or I'm an environmental educator. And that kind of like starts that conversation. We're like, oh. How many people have asked you, oh, or told you, man, I wanted to bring, be a marine biologist. Every and I was single like, one. Like literally every, every everybody <laughs> we meet, like, it's like, oh, I wanted to be a marine biologist. Or I was, and then I stop and look, I'm like, you still can. Yeah. You still yeah. are. Like people have this inkling that in order to be like this, you know, uh, ocean conservationist or an environmentalist that like you need making a yeah difference. like you have to have your degree or you have to be like a PhD with 500 certifications and gone to all these conferences and traveled the world to be these like quote whatever but if you're passionate about anything on the planet and you are into asking questions and you want to share and you want to poke and prod and lick sniff and smell all the crazy things that are in life and you're into it you're an environmentalist you're a conservationist right so what I would recommend is just follow your schnoz. Like, if it smells good, follow it. Go towards whatever is making you happy and passionate yeah. because it's one of those things that as a marine biologist, we kind of know going into it that you're doing it out of a passion because you're super into the water or, or salt stuff or octopus or you're totally into just like krill that live underneath the ice in the ice caps. Like, go after it. Research it. See if there's any events that are near you. Just the internet is great because you can just search opportunities and just volunteer your time. There's tons of organizations yeah. out there that just that want people to volunteer just to spread it and to just dive in, like literally and figuratively. Like, so go get your bikini on and go jackknife or cannonball in any close water near you because it's going to inspire. Getting in water you. is good. And actually, um, you brought up a good point too. The the idea that. Um, it's really good to be volunteering for everything, but each one of us has the capacity to be our own wave makers. Mm -hmm. And so give us some examples, maybe have some show and tell <laughs> of ways that you can avoid your uh, single use plastic usage. Um, go ahead and talk about why, why does this matter? Why should anybody care whether there's plastic on the beaches or in our waterways? Mm -hmm. And what can we do to reverse that? Okay. So, um, because I have my giant Mary Poppins bag uh, right next to me. I've we can got show my and tell now. Yeah, we can show and tell. So this, I carry a purse with me. I mean, it's a backpack, so it's really anybody can carry a backpack. Um, but I keep, I call it my, my, my waste free kit. And essentially, it's just an accumulation of things I've collected over time. So it's not like I just like went, oh, I got to save the ocean. I got to get rid of all my plastic stuff or get rid of the stuff that, that's bad. You know, that's the, the good thing about being ocean minded and, and conscious, especially about the products and the things that you buy, is that you don't have to get rid of anything that you have, just transform the things you have into stuff that will be useful forever. So being a, a zero waster, a plastic free person, or an ocean minded um, lifestyle person, is just any decision that you make is based on the big wet thing that drives the climate of our planet, exactly. right? So it's just anything, okay, so what am I eating? Am I eating food that is reducing my carbon footprint that in fact will uh, contribute to greenhouse gas emissions? And can I, can I reduce something that lowers my carbon footprint in that aspect? Or can, by, by doing that, am I gonna be able to effectively remove enough CO2 from our atmosphere to make more of a buffer in our oceans for ocean acidification? And then you can think, well, let me think of my trash, all this. It gets really overwhelming because you can just think of every single thing you do connecting to the water. So what I do is yeah. I'll go in my house and I'm sitting in my yard or I'm sitting anywhere that I'm, I'm at and I go, what can I do? to simply switch over. So in my purse, I, I literally carry a zero waste kit because in my opinion, because I'm like super into the marine debris plastic pollution train, that was the first and easiest thing for me to transition because as a, an athlete growing up, I always had everything that I bring to practice. So I've always brought um, a water bottle. I always brought like mm -hmm. reusable like sandwich containers or whatever and would have all those things. So bringing a reusable cup water bottle, my reusable bags. Let's look at this for stuff half a second. It was so. easy. 
what is in these bags look all kinds of different straws these are all stainless steel straws so rather than using a plastic straw the problem with plastic straws is you use them for five minutes and then you're done and then they're never used again right and so we're using so many of these straws so either say no to straw or get something they're made from all different materials let me see this. oh yeah this yeah. is fun too you can also bring your own um, uh, cutlery utensils. utensils this is all made of bamboo ah! So it really is just a matter of just being mindful to reduce your use of plastic. Mm -hmm. She's carrying her own bag. What is this? So this, I got this, um, it's just like a big cravat like hanky and I keep it in my purse like folded in a really tiny bag. So if I don't have, this is a reusable bag that's in the shape of a manta. Wait, what? Sorry. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> Look at that. that so and um, I keep all my keys a uh, collapsible reusable bag so it doesn't take up much space. Yeah. But if I don't have either of these bags with me, I keep something like this on me because what I can do is I, I act like Huckleberry Finn and I'll take all of my stuff and tie all the corners and literally have like this Huckleberry Finn pack. Voila. Then people don't be like, whoa, that's clever. I'm like, well, I saw it somewhere and it was really, it was clever. And it's funny because like I have bandanas, so I didn't really need to yeah. buy it, but you can use all those things. Like I've gone out of Walgreens with like toilet paper and like stuff in my shirt because I didn't want to carry a bag. <laughs> um, so all of those things are things that I do to reduce my waste. And by reducing my waste, I'm putting less pressure on the landfill. Um, I save money because I'm not buying things all the time. Um, and I feel better because I look at my ingredients now and I go, I want whole ingredients or the ingredients that are in here aren't putting chemicals into the ocean or the people that are treating the things that I'm buying or are testing are doing it in a sustainable, environmentally savvy way. Mm -hmm. So just kind of slowly thinking about everything in your house and what you're doing, your habits, you can take these tiny little, tiny little steps. So, so maybe today, like a straw thing or like coffee. I keep this in my car. Actually, I stash them all over the place. So it's not limited to my bag, but I stash <laughs> them and I'm sure you do you just like plant things. So no matter what you have, you, ha you don't have an excuse. So going to a place like Starbucks, for example, granted I'm not a spokesperson, hashtag not sponsored, but like Starbucks or Target even, Lucky's Market, places that reward you for making a good decision by bringing your own cup. You can reduce tons. Imagine how much coffee you drink in a day and you go to Wawa or you go to wherever and get your cup. If you can just use one of these, they give you discounts, like five cents off, 10 cents off, buy one, get one kind of thing. Like they, people reward you for making these decisions. Mm -hmm. So just taking a step back and don't going all the way into the deep end because it can get very overwhelming, Right. you know? One thing at a time. Maybe, so, maybe commit to doing what one thing, the first step, one thing, 30 days. Yeah. The next 30 days, something Try new. something else. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a really good tactic. So yeah, it'll take a while, and, but you just have to stay positive and every little thing you do matters and just always remember that like I'm making a difference just by thinking about it yeah so you want to see that change literally figuratively see change um, because you're you're watching it before your eyes you're taking whatever you're observing or listening and you're transforming that into something that that makes you in charge of your future and right. the planet. We all have a choice. Mm -hmm. And you know, you've obviously made a lot of really neat choices in your life to get you to this point and to be in the position that you are now. What is your favorite part of what you do? The light bulb. Like the that light bulb you see that switches when someone gets it. And ding 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 ding. Yeah, ding, like, I just saw all those light bulbs go up. Right? Yeah, like it's just <laughs> where you funny. you connect and you're like, it's you know it, I think they call it nausea vision when you're like watching a TV show or whatever where the camera zooms out but it the camera's physically moving forward so it's got that weird like warpy like mm -hmm. thing that happens like that moment where everything stops, the world shuts up behind you like a supernova. Everything sucks in, holds on for a second. I can do something right. like that moment watching that happen with kids with yeah. my grandparents like just anybody that I've connected with even strangers like just watching that light bulb go off is the coolest thing because then they now they're their own independent ocean minded humanoid and they're going off there I learned this really cool thing I saw this somewhere I really can I, I want to share it and that's what matters is just sharing is caring kind of thing like like what is the care bears all the the, and the rainbows education and rainbows out. and science shoots out of their <laughs> bellies and you're like yes like that is that's my favorite part to be honest 
besides getting in the ocean, like swimming with sharks or playing with coral or doing anything like just watching somebody see that moment for the first time, like their first organism that makes them really interested, like man, Whew, I get goosebumps on my left leg. We got goosebumps left over here. Left leg, only the left leg. I, I, I totally hear that. I so hear that. And it, I think it comes from the fact that we recognize that and we remembered how it made us feel to get it and to mm -hmm. realize that there was something bigger out there that we love so much that we could actually, you know, that we wanted to protect it and care for yeah. it. And so seeing that in somebody else and you know knowing what that then leads to mm -hmm. is uh it's like oh yeah 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 you're gonna be happier in life yeah. oh you're gonna like really enjoy like what our blue planet has to offer us so. yeah and i'm like really super thankful that not only i met you as a human but your mission with your wave makers and your conversations mm -hmm. by the sea and the blue mindedness and just getting everybody else's message because that's like really what we're talking about is just yeah. taking people's messages and just putting them into like right. the cyberspace and or like the abyssal plane the d deep depths of the ocean to get everybody on board and it makes me a very honored humanoid to be here ah. sharing that with you because like we we're just these like mermaids that just want to like yeah why not? Like, hang out and <laughs> save the planet like it's just and it's great when you get to do it with people that you like like, you know <laughs> oh that's so true oh my gosh thank you so much well I mean um I I love everything that you're doing we we have a really awesome community I'm so glad to know you as well and so neat to, to be building um, the, this community that we have down here and you know actually on that note we will be um, putting together some exciting opportunities for folks to come together in real life, not just here in the live, but in <laughs> real, real life, life to um, do more of this, connect, spend time by water, create ideas, create a movement, mm -hmm. make change here in South Florida and then spread it out elsewhere. So we're really excited to be announcing that in the coming weeks, stay tuned. And in the meantime, Morgan, where can people know more about you and maybe read some of the work that, that you've put out there? And where can they follow you? Yeah, okay, so um, you can follow me on Instagram at mo, M O underscore C's underscore. That's my Instagram handle. It's also my Twitter handle. S E A S. Yeah, S E A S. Um, so it's like that pun, like I see things, but I, I also it. the ocean. It's. It makes sense. It's it works. clever, um, and so that's on my that's my Twitter handle. So I share whole tons of stuff. So if you ever want to um, join any petitions that are going on, or um, contact your local legislation or anything, your local government about things that you can directly ask your government to change, like putting enacting um, single use plastic ordinances, or saying no to offshore drilling, or protecting our shark finning trade, like let's get that out of state of Florida immediately. It's illegal here, but like, I mean, really, it's still, it's still an issue. So we've got to like, I share all that kind of stuff. And on both of those, I do a lot of education too. So most of my posts, there's always like a little bit of a learning snippet. Like I peer pressure that into your eyeballs when you scroll. So you're gonna learn a little bit of something. I do have a YouTube. I'm trying to get it a little bit more oh, up. Great. Yeah. You can just search Morgan Knowles um, and I'll pop up. I'm trying to like put more content on there, but finding time to do that is like, out of all the crazy volunteer work that I do and all the stuff, with work work and like, surf rider and foundation. surf rider foundation so yeah. i'm always doing that and and the ocean friendly restaurants program so i'm like constantly approaching yeah. restaurants to try to say hey dudes like you can save tons of thousands of dollars and save the ocean just by you know making simple little decisions so uh, finding time to make content is going to be a little frustrating but i love doing it and i um i've got some things in the woodwork that are going to be coming out really soon this is really cool so i can't really spill any beans yet because it's not finalized but when it does i'll let everybody know on my social um, Ooh, but yeah, you can check exciting. out all the organizations that I hang out with, like Dune Restorations, Youth Environmental Alliance. We're partnered with Hands on Broward, and um, we are funded by Community Foundation and Fish Florida and a whole bunch of other people to do this and just come to one of our events. So if you go to Youth Environmental Alliance's um, event page, tons of Dune Restorations you can come to, or you can do a citizen science project with any of the nonprofits that do science and stuff on the beaches around here or out diving. So it's out there. You just got to do a couple of clickety doos and yeah, yeah. And we'll be sure also to provide those links for you all in the comments section. We want to say hi to all those. Hi, Katie Correa. Yeah. Woo! 
yeah, she's another water woman. We'll have yeah. to make it to the islands to interview you. Mm -hmm. Can I come? <laughs> I know, I right? Come. So um, I know there's a lot of you that showed up. Thank you so much for joining us today on Conversations by Water. This was a really fun episode. Woo! We have lots of information for you. We'll put more stuff down in the uh, comments section. If you have any questions, please ask them in the comments. We'll be sure to stick around afterwards to make sure we get to all of those. Mm -hmm. So once again, thank you so much, Morgan, for yeah! being an amazing wave mm -hmm. maker. We're very lucky to have you in our world. Well, thank you so much for having me. It was yeah. really awesome. And until next time, everybody, I hope you join us again for Conversations by Water. And, uh, you know, you too can be a wave maker. We hope that this inspires you to also be part of the ripple effect to create change in your community and beyond. So take care, everybody. Until next time, wishing you water. Bye. Bye.